the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the Bible says that Abraham believed God and that was counted for righteousness. Abraham didn't have any and we don't have any. And tonight we come together in the name of the one and only one who is righteous and his name is Jesus. And I greet you in his name. Thank you for being in this Monday evening session of Bible Conference on this 36th conference. I'm telling you, when we started these, I still had black shoe polish on my hair, and it's all gone now. But boy, we are still enjoying the things of God, and God has proven himself faithful. As I welcome those of you in this building, I welcome those who join us by live stream, and we're delighted that you have chosen to be a part of this service also. Let's stand together, and in whatever manner you're comfortable greeting each other, let's do that at this time. For he has made me glad. Let's everyone sing together. Sing with me now. I will enter. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will sing with his name that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Thank you. 
got something good to know tonight. Amen? Amen. And you may be seated. We were blessed this morning to have the Milan Hayes family come and sing for us after traveling 14 hours, I think, on Sunday to make it here to be with us. And we are so thrilled to have them back with us this week. They are singing every morning. Also, I want to make sure you know, Wednesday night, does anybody know what time we're going to start Wednesday night? 6.50, we will have a mini concert by the Milan Hayes family. You do not want to miss that, so make sure that you are here. Welcome the Milan Hayes family to the evening service. Handed him a stone, her fate was in his hands. But he bent down alone to write something in the sand. It was a message for the ages, a prophetic word from God. What would, what had Jesus written to forever mark that spot? Could it be grace happened here? Someone who was guilty now is free. The mark of sin you will never see. All debt is clear. So who will dare to rise and cast a stone? When all the sins you're looking for are gone The sweetest phrase to fall on human ear Is grace happened sermon of conviction my past was all revealed helpless my condition so I found a place to kneel embracing for the judgment of a holy jealous God but instead I felt a cleansing and I could take you to that spot and say grace happened here someone who was guilty now is free the mark of sin you will never see all debt is clear so who will dare to rise when all the sins you're looking for are gone The sweetest phrase to fall on human ears Is grace happened The sweetest phrase to fall on you and is grace happen here. Grace happen here. Well, if 
if you like that, you'll hear something like that again in the morning. And these folks are humble. They love their God. And I just can't tell you my gratitude for their presence in these morning sessions. And we really wanted to whet your appetite and hope that you'll be back with us, God willing, in the morning as we will be blessed in the session then. You know, all of life is about grace, isn't it? If you look back on your testimony prior to the Lord saving you, you see God's grace protecting you from destroying yourself until he saved you, and then you just see a pattern of grace. I was talking to one of the preachers today, or to Jack, or someone uh, you know, after you have gone down the roadways, you glance in the rearview mirror and you say, you know, it was all about him all along, wasn't it? It's what he did. That brings me to share something with this church family. I hope we'll just once again highlight the grace of God. I shared with you on Sunday that starting August 8, Miss Joyce Croft will be our pianist. Let me tell you something. Her husband, Colbert, who is in heaven was licensed to preach by the Gordon Street Baptist Church, which was Morningside on Gordon Street, transferred over here in 1970, and Gordon Street became Morningside. Colbert was licensed to preach by Gordon Street Baptist Church. July 19, 1964, that's 57 years ago today, and the God of all grace 57 years ago is still the God of all grace. And the God who has graced Colbert and Joyce Croft through all these years is the same God who can grace and will grace your life if you just give him a little chance to be what he wants to be in your life. When the church, Gordon Street, uh, licensed him, that was 22 days after he and Miss Joyce married. And so... You look back on the trail, and I'll promise you this, with every passing day, you'll be grateful for the life that you lived for Jesus, and you'll always regret what you could not have, what you could have done, but you did not do. And when we preachers get so frustrated at times, and singers, and other Christians, we don't want you to live a life of regret. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. And tonight, as we hear the music and the preaching, if you don't know Christ, give your heart away to him. Would you do that? Let's pray for this service. Bow with me, please. Our Father, you said in your word that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. You let us know that we were destitute, that none were righteous, none understood, and none could seek after God. We had all altogether gone out of the way. We had become unprofitable, and there was none that doeth good, no, not one. And with a human race that was bound and determined for a eternity separated from God and all that was good your great heart of grace determined to step into our personal existence and interrupt our plans and our highway that was headed to hell and only by grace you sent somebody into our life who shared the gospel either in printed tract form or through the printed scriptures or in a song or a sermon and then the convicting power of the Holy Spirit gripped us gave us an awareness of our lostness and our need of you and you made our heart willing and in that moment of miraculous regeneration we became willing people to acknowledge that we were sinners to desire you and call on you and we are mindful that if any man confesses with his mouth the Lord Jesus and has come to believe that God hath raised him from the dead, that person is miraculously born again. And Lord, as much as we needed you to save us, we need you to sustain us. And the purposes of these conferences, of revivals, and of the New Testament church Sunday after Sunday is to proclaim that good news 
that Jesus Christ is the one and only Lord of heaven and Lord of earth. The one who's come to make possible saving grace in the hearts of any man, woman, boy, or girl who turns in simple faith and repentance to you. Thank you for the truth that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord can be and will be saved. And tonight we look back in the rearview mirror thanking you for the moment when you interrupted and intercepted our lives. Thank you for letting us be your children and for keeping us steadfast. We are, as the hymn writer said, prone to wander. Lord, we feel it. We are prone to leave the one and only God who loves us. Now tonight, in a very special way as only you can do, take our hearts, remove anything that needs to be removed, bring us to an awareness of that which is present that needs to be dealt with, and grant that we will turn our backs on anything that is a displeasure to you and that we will turn our lives afresh to your Lordship and yield to you. For we recognize that it is in our hearts as your children to spend eternity with you. And if we're going to spend eternity with you, we want to live our days from now until you call us into your presence in a way that would please and honor you and help others through this same message finally come to know you. Thank you for what has already been presented to us in these brief hours we've been together. And we, Lord, now are receptive and are willing to receive whatever you want to say to us. We yield to your Spirit who alone can lead and guide us into truth. And we reject and renounce every foul, ugly, dirty spirit. And any foul spirit, go where Christ sends you in the strong name of Jesus. We don't deserve to be your people, but you have made us your people by grace. And we rejoice, not so much that demons are subject to us, but we do rejoice that our names have been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Church family, if you agree with that, would you say amen? amen. And now, Father, the best we can render to you, we give ourselves to you. Thank you for giving yourself to us and we make our prayers collectively in the name of Jesus, our wonderful Lord. Amen. Our choir is going to sing, and Jack Price is coming with them. And I'll tell you, he has sent us to glory and back. And so we receive now the message. Brother Jack, Miss Sharon, Sherry, we love you all, and we're so grateful to have you here. And may you get even a touch of blessing from your dad and your husband like we get as the people of God. Listen as they sing. Savior hung between two thieves. Hear the soldiers mock his name. See his followers as they cry in disbelief. This could not be the reason that he came. See him realize. His life is through. Feel the love flow from his eyes. Behold the temple veil as it is torn in two. And hear the one on Calvary as he cries. Paid in full. in full I pay the final price for you when all hell tries to tell you you'll never win just remember that the day
Children torn between two ways. Some still choose to mock his name. Hear his followers now as they can boldly say, We are the reason that he came. See the one to trust themselves alone to do what only Christ can do to Jesus blood alone we may approach the Father's throne and hear the words that he still calls me that debt's been paid. Aren't you glad the debt is not just partly paid, it's paid in full. While the choir's coming down, I want to introduce our preacher that really needs no introduction, but deserves one better than I'll be able to give him. But I love him like a brother. I love him as a brother. Dr. Gerald Harris has pastored churches in Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. He's been the editor of the Baptist State Paper. He has a pen that is mighty because God has given him a mighty heart and mind for the things of God. Uh, Brother Herman Parker said of Jack Price one time, when we get to heaven, I'm going to ask God if he gives us everything new, will, we, will he give me Jack's old voice? I'd like to have that. That's a, good, that's a good statement to make. Dr. R.G. Lee, who was a person that touched the life of Jack Price and Dr. Harris and touched my young life, told the story in my home church of being at a civic group one day. And he's talked to that civic group about the miracle of God in creation. And he shared that, uh, among other things, that... Sodium is poisonous, chloride is poisonous. You put them together and you get something that we put on food called salt. And he said, that's the miracle of the Creator. He said, hydrogen is very flammable, oxygen is flammable. You put hydrogen and oxygen together and you get something that you put out flame with that we call water. And he spent his 
brilliant mind and sharing with that Rotary Club that day or whatever civic club that was about the God of creation and how you can see his hand. And a person came to him at the end of that program and got in his face, which wouldn't be a wise thing to do. It's not good for a pen knife to come up against a sword. And so that person said, you can't stick what you know in my head. He said, I reckon not. It'd be like putting a grand piano in a junk closet. <laughs> if I could have Dr. Gerald Harris's mind, it would be putting a grand piano in a junk closet. He has the brilliance that God has gifted him with, and he has a heart to go with that. And sometimes you find lots of brilliance, but you don't find much of a heart for God. We're honored to have Dr. and Mrs. Gerald Harris. Would you make them welcome as Dr. Harris comes? What a treat to be here this year when Brother Wayne called me several months ago and asked if I would be willing to come. I said, well, Brother Wayne, you know I'm 80 now. Of course, Jack Price has been 80 for a long time. <laughs> no, actually, I'm, what, three months older than you are, I believe. And I won't forget it. Now, and you won't let me forget it. <laughs> But anyway, I said, you know, there's some liabilities that come with old age, at least so far as I am concerned, uh, excluding Brother Jack. Uh, in fact, I was watching a video that resonated very well with me. This is a video that you can find on YouTube. It's a video by a lady by the name of Mary Maxwell, and she's in her 80s. And she said, the other day, my husband pulled up to a curbside mailbox and ordered a cheeseburger and french fries. Because that's what old people do. And I do have a problem. It seems like every time I go to the published grocery store to get something for Martha Jean, that when I come out, somebody's moved my car to a different parking place. I don't understand that. And this Ms. Maxwell said that uh, the other day she went to church and she pulled her dill put her Dillard's uh, bill in the collection plate. <laughs> I wonder if the church paid it. She said, I went into the wrong end of a car wash. And the lady coming from the other direction looked surprised to see me. And I was as surprised as she was <laughs> to see her. The other day uh, we went to the... Uh, grocery store. When we came home, Martha Jean put her purse in the refrigerator. We spent the rest of the day looking for the tenderloin. <laughs> but that's just what happens when you're old. But Brother Jack, you have risked your reputation in life on inviting an old man like me to preach today, but I'm grateful for the privilege of doing so. And I reciprocate. I love your pastor with all my heart and his family as well. And it's a delight to be here. I had the privilege of uh, watching the service as we were driving down uh, last night, and it was wonderful, and uh, I just love the music of uh, Brother Jack and uh, Mylon Hayes and his family. I just And Wendy's from my hometown. We're both from Valdez, North Carolina. Valdez, Valdez makes uh, uh, Valdosta look like a, a metropolis, but anyway, <laughs> both of us managed to escape and we're, uh, I'm glad she's here. And you know, I, when Brother Herman Parker retired, they were looking for somebody to come and fill the pulpit. And, and somehow I had a few Sundays available and I preached there for six Sundays. And uh, the worst mistake I've ever made in my life was trying to follow Brother Herman Parker. They were used to great preaching. I think I maybe got a C minus in their preaching category, but I love the conference, I love the people that come, I love this church, and I'm very grateful for the privilege of sharing a message with you tonight. And the text is going to be in Acts chapter 17, and I want to speak on the subject, facing the challenge of a faltering society. Facing the challenge of a faltering society. And uh, a good bit of what I'm going to say tonight, maybe... 30-40% is in the book that I have written, which Brother Wayne mentioned uh, this morning on the rise and fall of the conservative resurgence. And so uh, 
I want us to uh, pray that God will help us to have a right spirit, to preach the truth in love, and hopefully God will inhabit the message and communicate His truth to your heart. It's a long passage, so I'm going to allow you to remain seated as I read, beginning in verse 16 of Acts 17. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, What will this babbler say? Other some, He seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by, I beheld your devotions. And and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeth that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needeth anything seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might fill after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Forasmuch then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because... He hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men that in he hath, in that he raised him from the dead. And when they heard of some resurrection of the dead, they mocked. And others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from them from among them. Howbeit certain men clave to him and believed, among the which was Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, it's good to be in your house tonight and it's good to be with your people. It's good to be among those who serve you faithfully and love you dearly, and come to worship expectantly, believing that you are at work to move in our hearts, to change us, to challenge us to greater Christian living. Father, we live in a very perilous time, a time which demands Christians to rise up and stand for truth and justice and righteousness. Help us to be those people who do not shrink in a time of challenge, but who stand tall, armed with the Word of God, filled with the Spirit, to change this world for the cause of the kingdom. We pray, dear Father, that you would use this message to touch the hearts and lives of people. 
And may we leave this building not just moved, but changed. We pray in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. The Apostle Paul gathered three preacher-slash-missionaries and started out on his second missionary journey. They crossed over the Hellespont, the narrow strait between Asia and Europe, to go into Macedonia to preach the gospel for the first time in Europe. As they entered the country, they went to Philippi, which was the major city in that section of Macedonia. And they began their ministry. Luke, the beloved uh, doctor who wrote the gospel that bears his name and the acts of the apostles, was left in Philippi. Timothy remained in Thessalonica. Silas was left in Berea. Paul went on to Athens and waited for Timothy and Silas to join him. Athens at that time was the greatest university city in the world. People came from everywhere to Athens in order to gain knowledge. It was a city of many philosophies and ideologies and idolatries. And in this city, it was said that there were more gods than in all the rest of Greece put together. And that it was easier to find a god than a man in Athens. And there were people who would gather in the market square day and night to discuss some new idea or some new philosophy. And so I want us to observe what Paul encountered when he went to Athens. And I want us to compare it to what is happening in our nation and in our denomination today. I want to be as honest and as straightforward with you as I can possibly be. We need to see it like it is so we can tell it like it is and we do not need to live under a delusion. I heard about this uh, verbose professor who was standing on the street corner in a county seat town and as he stood there, there was a motorist that drove up to the stoplight and this verbose professor noticed that his right front tire was almost completely flat. He flagged down the attention of the motorist. He moved his window down. And the verbose professor said, I perceive that your tubular conveyance is not functioning at its maximum capacity. The motorist said, Sir, what did you say? He said, I am trying to tell you that your tubular air container has lost its rotundity. He said, I don't understand. He said, I'm trying to tell you that the elastic frame that surrounds the circular uh, uh, contrivance that successive uh, uh, revolutions bear you onward is not working in an efficacious manner. The little boy sitting on the curb said, oh, mister, you got a flat tire. So we want to lay it down as straight as we possibly can. The first thing that I want to see is Paul's anguish. Look in verse 16, if you will, of chapter 17. Paul comes to Athens. And the Bible says that his spirit was stirred within him when he saw that the city was wholly given over to idolatry. Now, when I read that, I thought of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 9, as he stands over the city of Jerusalem, and the Bible says, and he was moved with compassion when he saw the multitude because they were fainted and scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Paul was deeply concerned and filled with anguish when he saw the idolatry of 
Athens and Jesus was concerned and filled with sorrow when he saw that the people were lost and scattered in Jerusalem. In fact, the phrase moved with compassion is the translation of one Greek word, splagnizomai, which means moved to the point of an emotional and physical upheaval. And I believe that Paul was moved in that way and Jesus was moved in that way when he saw the conditions of the respective cities. When I read that, I thought about David Brainerd, the young missionary to the Indians in the northeastern part of this country in the middle part of the 18th century. He was weak physically. He had tuberculosis. He died when he was 30 years of age. But he was a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And on July the 21st, 1744, he wrote in his diary these words, Towards night, my burden, respecting my work, among the Indians increased much. I was in great anguish. I cared not what or how I lived or what hardships I endured if I could but gain souls for Christ. I thought about John Knox who said, God give me Scotland or let me die. I thought about Susanna Wesley who had 19 children, two of which were John and Charles Wesley. It is said that every night when she prayed, she said, Oh God, I will not stand before thee without all my children. I thought about William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, who said some men's ambition is art. Some men's ambition is fame. Some men's ambition is gold. My ambition is the souls of men. I thought about Charles Haddon Spurgeon who said, If men should should die and if they be damned, at least let them leap over our bodies into hell. If souls must perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees imploring them to be saved. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertion and let no one go there unwarned or unprayed for. I thought about the song, Rescue the Perishing, Care for the Dying, Snatch them in pity from sin in the grave, Weep for the erring ones, Lift up the fallen, Tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. I thought of Psalm 126 which says, He that goeth forth weeping, Bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing their sheaves with them. John R. Rice, the Baptist evangelist of a previous generation, went to college and began to preach for the first time. God had called him to preach, but he'd not had any opportunity until he went to college. He said he was so thrilled with God's call to the ministry, so overcome with God's grace, so compassionate for those who heard him preach that he could not preach through a sermon without weeping from the beginning to the end. And he said, sometimes I had no control over my emotions at all and I would have to stop my sermon and weep and try to get my emotions under control before I can continue. And I was embarrassed about that and I was ashamed of my tears and I knelt down and I asked God to take away my tears. And he did. But I also noticed that the people stopped responding as they had previously. And I got on my knees, John R. Rice said, And I asked God to give me a broken heart and tears again. I believe that we need to look at our city as Paul looked at Athens. And we need to look at our city as Jesus looked at Jerusalem. You know, I feel like it's going to become increasingly difficult for pastors to preach the whole counsel of God in the days ahead. And yet at the same time, I'm convinced that we need preachers like Paul, who was fervent in his messages and preached without fear or favor. We need preachers like Elijah, who stood on Mount Carmel and and hurled thunderbolts of truth at the prophets of Baal. We need preachers like John the Baptist, who stood on the banks of the Jordan River and addressed his congregation in which there were Sadducees and Pharisees. And he said, you generation of vipers, 
Beware of the wrath to come. You need preachers like Peter who stood up on the day of Pentecost. No telling how many thousand people heard him that day, but yet he dared to shake his long bony finger into the faces of those people, some of which were scribes and Pharisees who were probably more responsible for the death of Jesus than anyone else. And he said, with wicked hands, you have crucified this same one whom God hath made both Lord and Christ. And 3,000 souls were saved in one day. But Brother Wayne, it's going to get more difficult for us. I thought about Matt Peak today as he was preaching this morning and did such a wonderful job. And I thank God that we have some young preachers coming along who believe the word and who are passionate about the ministry. But there's no telling what that young man may have to face in the years to come if he continues to be faithful to the Lord. Let me give you an example. The world today is doing everything it can to normalize homosexuality. I'm talking about corporate America. I'm talking about professional sports. I'm talking about our system of education. I'm talking about the political arena. And you know, last June 15, 2020, the Supreme Court ruled that transgendered individuals should have the same rights and privileges provided in Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And some have said that it is a tremendous threat to religious liberty in America, the decision that they made. But in view of that decision, and in view of the fact that many Americans are becoming more and more hostile to sold-out Christians, the church must not capitulate. We need to be strong in the Lord. We need to be strong in the power of His might. And we dare not give in or give up. We must continue to preach as fervently and as passionately as we know how to preach. It's important for us to do that. But Brother Wayne, if you do that, even in your time, it may be that you will be sued It may be that you will have to go to jail. I had lunch with Mike Griffin last week, and we were talking about these things, and he said, I don't believe any preachers are going to be hung for preaching the whole counsel of God today. But he said, every time the Supreme Court makes a decision like it did last June, it puts another plank in the gallows. So you see Paul's anguish? The Southern Baptist Convention lost or declined in 2019 by 287,655. Last year, and I know we had the COVID, but the decline was 435,632. The population in the United States has grown by over 36 million in the last 15 years. Southern Baptist Convention has declined by two and a half million, almost two and a half million in that same period of time. But where is our anguish? Where is our passion for the things of God? Where is our hunger hunger to see people one to faith in Christ? But let's get on. There's Paul's anguish. Secondly, let's look at Paul's ardor. Now, that's not a very familiar word today, but it's a good word. It means zeal. It means fervor. We we have sung the song, give of your best to the master. Give of the strength of your youth. Throw your soul's fresh glowing ardor into the battle for truth. You see, this second missionary journey began in the 16th chapter of Acts. And when Paul got to Philippi, we can say that he had fervor, he had passion, he had ardor. The first group that he met were some folks down by the riverside. He and Paul and Silas and Timothy were going there for a time of prayer, and they met a woman by the name of Lydia. And Lydia was a seller of purple from Thyatira. They won her to faith in Christ, and she and her family were baptized. And then Paul cast a demon out of a woman who had a spirit of divination. 
Now, the Bible doesn't say this, but I believe, and would like to believe at least, when the spirit, went, when the spirit of the devil went out, the spirit of the Lord came in. And she was converted. And you know, there were some men in Philippi who'd been padding their pocketbooks because of her fortune-telling ability. And when the demon went out, they saw that they no longer could get fortune from her or money from her fortune-telling ability. So they captured Paul and Silas. They took them to the magistrates. They said, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. And so Paul and Silas were stripped of their clothing. They were beaten. They were thrown into jail. And you know the story of what happened while they were there. At the darkest hour of the night, they began to pray and sing praises to God. There was an earthquake. The jailer came to Paul and Silas and said, What must I do to be saved? And they told him how, and he was saved. And then he took them to his house, and his wife and his children were saved and baptized. And then Paul and Silas went on to Thessalonica, and Paul preached for three consecutive Sabbaths in the synagogue. But there were some non-believing Jews that stirred up a violent mob against them. And they had to leave by night to go to Berea. And in Berea, he found the people more noble than the people of Thessalonica. And he said... They received the word with readiness of mind, and they searched the scriptures daily, and many of them were saved. But the people who had stirred up a mob in Thessalonica came to Berea to threaten Paul and Silas, and Paul had to leave by night, and he went on to Athens. But do you see his ardor, his passion? And all through Acts of the Apostles, you'll see how Paul suffered for the cause of Christ. Shipwrecks, beatings, imprisonments, stonings. Because he had a desire to do something great for God. Now, when he got to Athens, there was not physical harm, but there was verbal abuse. He began to preach to them, and they called him a babbler. That's an interesting word in the Greek language. It's the word spermologos, which means seed picker. It's the picture of a bird hopping around in your backyard, going here and there, gathering seeds. So in essence, they were saying, Paul, you're a seed picker. You go here, there, and yonder, picking up tidbits of information, repeating them as your own without any real clear understanding of what they mean. It was a very condescending, contemptuous term for the Apostle Paul. So they didn't harm him physically, but they were abusing him verbally. And yet he continued to press on with what God had called him to do. He was not about to be delayed or silenced by those who criticized him or those who threatened to harm him. He was full of passion. He was full of anguish and then he was full of ardor. And I believe we need to have that kind of passion and ardor in our own lives. But then I want you to notice next his assignment. You know, when he was called to preach, of course, he was on the Damascus Road. He saw that brilliant light. He was blinded. God told him that he needed to go into Damascus to a street called Straight where he'd meet a man by the name of Ananias. Ananias became the human instrument whereby I believe Paul was actually converted. And Ananias was told to lay hands on Paul, recover his sight, see that he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and say to him, you are a chosen vessel. God says you are my chosen vessel to bear my name among the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And then Paul actually recalls his assignment in Galatians chapter 1 when he says, It pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him unto the Gentiles. So he had an assignment and he was eager to share the gospel. But you know something? When he got to Athens, they not only called him a babbler, but he saw all of these various philosophies. And he names two of them. There were the Epicureans and there were the Stoics. Now these are two uh, philosophies that are poles apart. The Epicureans were the good time Charlies of the world. Their philosophy was eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Their philosophy was all about indulgence. And they were set on having 
a high, good time with their lives. On the other hand, there were the Stoics. And while this group was all about indulgence, the Stoics were all about indifference. They didn't believe anything. They didn't care about anything. They were dead to feelings and emotions. And whereas the Epicureans were about enjoying life, they were about enduring life. And I believe there were a lot of philosophies in between the two. You know, the Apostle Paul probably thought about these philosophies when he wrote the church in Corinth and he said, the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. You see, Paul could look down the corridors of time with the telescope of faith and tell what was in the future. And he wrote Timothy and he said, In the latter days, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And he said, The time will come when God himself will send strong delusion. And folks, I hate to say this, but I believe we're living in a day when many, many people would prefer to believe a lie rather than the truth. Years ago, Adolf Hitler said, if you tell a lie big enough and often enough, people will believe it. I think that's why fake news is flourishing and truth has fallen in the streets. But that's exactly what's happened in this country. And I'm telling you that the devil doesn't want us to believe the truth. He wants us to doubt the truth. And so he offers all of these alternatives to the truth. One of the alternatives is relativism. Relativism is the view that truth is always changing. The relativists believe that there's no absolute truth. That uh, truth is just changing all the time. It's relative. And I think when I was here and preached for the associational meeting down at the Civic Center, I told you about Willie Nelson. Willie Nelson before he got in trouble with the IRS, on his own golf course. And Brother Jack, uh, a friend, went to see him one time and said, uh, let's play golf. Willie Nelson said, fine. They start off on the first tee box, and he said, now what's the par here? Willie Nelson said, the par is 47. I birdied it yesterday. <laughs> that is relativism. But the Barna Research Group, did a survey not long ago in which they determined that 67% of the adults in America no longer believe in absolute truth. And 52% of those who said they were born again Christians indicated they believed that truth was relative. Folks, truth is absolute and it comes from God. Psalm 119, 89 says, The Word of God is settled in the heavens. I believe before Isaiah ever uttered one word of prophecy, it was already written down in heaven. The same is true of Moses and David and, and, and Paul and John and Peter and those who are the writers of the books of the Bible. Folks, there is absolute truth in this world and it comes from heaven. And we didn't embrace it and we never need to let it go. But there's relativism. Secondly, there's subjectivism. Subjectivism is the belief that what may be true for you is not necessarily true for me. And what's true for you uh, or what's true for me may not necessarily be true for you. In other words, uh, everybody has their own version of truth. Now, some years ago, in U.S. News and World Report, there was an article entitled Land of Liars, and in that article they'd done a survey, and it says this. It said, America is a nation of individualized moral menus. An illustration of that came in 2008 when Rick Warren, a Baptist pastor in California, interviewed Barack Obama on television, who was running for president the first time. And Dr. Warren asked the presidential candidate, what is your definition of sin? And Mr. Obama said, sin is when I fail to live up to my own values. That's like the day of the judges, when everybody did that which was right in their own eyes. But now listen very carefully. When there is no common moral standard, a nation is in trouble. 
And we are sort of passing a common moral standard off to the periphery. Think about it. There are many cities in this country that are trying to defund the police. There are attorneys who do not want to prosecute criminals. There are judges who are letting hardened criminals leave jail in their own recognizance without having to pay bail. And in addition to that, we have substituted the rule of law with the doctrine of tolerance. And we're taking a giant step toward an antinomian society, which is a society without laws. And when you have a society without laws, you have anarchy. And we had a big taste of that last year in the streets of America. Now, this subjectivism is also a facet of humanism. And humanism is the deification of man and the humanization of God. And it puts man at the center of the universe. And man becomes the authority for all things. And I believe, Brother Wayne, that subjectivism is the basis for the felt needs, seeker-sensitive, consumer-friendly model for church planning and church growth. And it is about as far from biblical principles as a downtown tomcat is from Home Life magazine. So you need to dismiss any thought of relativism, any thought of subjectivism. Another ism that we have that should be a wasm, as Vance Havner would say, is play, or plagiarism too, I guess, but <laughs> that just slipped out. I'm talking, about, uh, I'm talking about the kind of philosophy where you just do what is successful. Do whatever is successful. In other words, you can just sort of cast aside the truth and go with whatever works. And there are a lot of people who have embraced that philosophy of life. Pragmatism. Pragmatism. Thank you, Brother Wayne. I need your help more than just <laughs> any time. But pragmatism may be one of the most serious philosophies that is present today. Because uh, in pragmatism, you just go with what works. In other words, if the Bible doesn't work, you may want to go with Norman Vincent Peale's power of positive thinking. Or you may want to go with Robert Schuller's possibility thinking. Or you may want to go with Joel Osteen's The Power of the I Am. And people who are involved in uh, this particular philosophy will say, you know, if we're going to have excitement in the church, if you can have more excitement, by having theatrical fog and strobe lights and the pastor coming in the pulpit on a zip line rather than from the prayer closet, then we'll go with the zip line, the theatrical fog, and the strobe lights. Now that's pragmatism. And it is a very dangerous philosophy. In fact, let me just say it this way. This particular philosophy is probably embraced by people, by pastors, who are more interested in drawing a crowd to church than they are in developing a congregation of spirit-filled believers who understand and obey the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And that is a serious problem in our denomination right now. But I need to mention one more thing. And, and this probably is the most serious. And that is socialism. Now, socialism is beginning to infiltrate the church. It's already pretty well infiltrated the nation. But it's beginning to infiltrate the church through what is called social justice. And social justice, you need to understand, has its roots in Marxist ideology. And uh, when I think about Marxist ideology, I, I think about some terms. Now, these are terms that will help you to understand social justice. Critical race theory, intersectionality, egalitarianism, redistribution of wealth, uh, progressive immigration policies, LGBTQ advocacy, identity politics. All these are entering into the church under the umbrella of social justice. 
In fact, I believe that social justice is being so magnified in our convention today that it is becoming a threat to the clarity and the simplicity of the gospel. Back in the 1950s and 60s, Brother Wayne, we were having to deal with the heresy of the social gospel. Today, we're having to deal with the heresy of the social gospel and social justice. Justice is mentioned 130 times in the Bible. It is never preceded by the word social. God cannot be the God of justice and social justice because social justice is not just. Justice seeks to give individuals what they deserve under the law. Social justice seeks to give individuals what they do not deserve because they are favored. Let me give you an example. Let's say you participate in a protest. And that protest evolves into a riot. And that riot escalates into the um, looting and burning of buildings. Justice will see that you are arrested, prosecuted, and sentenced. Social justice will see that you, uh, first of all, are determined as to whether or not you are oppressed. And if it is concluded that you are oppressed, you will be treated with favor. Now, I believe that if we've been reconciled to God, we need to be reconciled to one another. Regardless of race, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of socioeconomic background, we need to be reconciled to one another. When George Floyd was tragically killed, I mourned his death. I was saddened by what happened to him and to his family. But I think we'd all have to admit that that precipitated a crisis in this nation. And uh, when it precipitated the crisis in the nation, uh, there was chaos in the streets. There was anarchy in the streets. And no one was doing very much about the oppressed. And because of that, there was just trouble in cities all over the nation. One rioter was interviewed. And he was asked, what are you doing? He said, I'm tearing down the system. He said, why, the reporter said, why are you tearing down the system? He said, I don't like the system. The reporter said, well, what do you expect to put in place of the system? He said, I don't know. We haven't figured that out yet. And the reporter had the wisdom to say, do you not realize that those who have incited you to riot and those who in some cases are paying you to riot already know and have determined the kind of government they want to put in place of this republic. So Paul's assignment, he had a difficult assignment with all these philosophies. We have a tough assignment today. Brother Wayne, there was a time when I could go into about anybody's home with a Roman road and lead them to faith in Christ. You, it's hard to do that anymore because people are so muddled and confused by these philosophies. You have to break through all the barriers to get to someone's mind and heart to share the gospel. But I'm just telling you that that was Paul's assignment and it's our assignment. Our, our first response in this day is not to protest, it's not to riot, it's not to pillage, it's not to burn, it's to turn on the light. And in this day of darkness, in this day of false ideologies and foolish philosophies, we need to tell people everywhere the gospel of Jesus Christ and let them know that Jesus is the light of the world. Now let's move from the anguish and the ardor and the assignment of Paul to consider the arsenal of Paul. He had a weapon. It was just one, but he had a weapon. And the weapon that he had was the Word of God, the sword of the Lord. 
And if you read about the second missionary journey, in fact, if you read about all four missionary journeys, you'll find that Paul used the Word of God liberally in his preaching. And he also used it literally in his writing. In fact, in Paul's epistles, you will find the Old Testament referred to often. In fact, 45 times he referred to the Torah or the first five books of the Old Testament. 53 times he referred to the prophets. 36 of those times were a reference to the book of Isaiah. 23 times he referred to the Psalms. And on 10 occasions he referred to other books of the Old Testament. I mean, Paul was a Bible teacher, Bible preacher. He had this arsenal as the Word of God. And it's good that he did because Paul knew that the Word of God was not only sufficient for the people of Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea, but for the academically elite population of Athens. And he believed that the Word of God was superior to any other ideology or any other subject that those men would debate on Mars Hill or the Areopagus. In In the 1950s, the Rolls-Royce Automobile Company built an automobile called the Rolls-Royce Silver Dawn. And there was a man here in America who wanted to buy one of those automobiles. This is in the early 50s. And so he called the company. I believe the company for Rolls-Royce at that time was Brookwood, England. So he called the company. He asked for a salesperson. The salesperson got on the phone And this prospective buyer here in the United States said, I'm interested in buying a Rolls-Royce Silver Dawn. I've seen pictures of them. I've heard about them. And I have money and I want to buy one of those cars. But can you tell me the horsepower? And the salesman said, well, I want you to know that if you purchase a Rolls-Royce Silver Dawn, you'll be the owner of one of only 760 automobiles because that's how many we're going to make this year of the Silver Dawn. And the man said, well, that's good to know. I appreciate that. But what's the horsepower of the car? The salesman said, this particular car is the perfect balance between beauty and power. The prospective buyer said, well, that's good to know too, but I'd like to know the horsepower. He said, well, I want you to know if you purchase this car, you will ride in luxury and comfort And all of your friends will admire you and be jealous of how fortunate you are to have such an expensive and beautiful and prestigious automobile. The customer said, look, I I understand all that. I appreciate that. But I'd like to know the horsepower. And the salesman said, sir, I can tell you without reservation, hesitation, or qualification that the horsepower of the Rolls-Royce Silver Dawn is adequate. The Word of God is adequate. It is sufficient. In fact, the Bible teaching of the sufficiency of Scripture simply means that the Bible is the only revelation necessary to equip believers in the Christian life and service. It tells us all about who God is, who we are, our broken relationship with Him, the plan of redemption, and how we're to live as redeemed people. In fact, in Psalm 19, we have a monumental and a concise statement about the sufficiency of Scripture. In that psalm, which is a psalm of David, the king of Israel says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimonies of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord is true and righteous altogether. John Greenleaf Whittier said, We search the world for truth. We call the good, the true, the beautiful from graven stone and written scroll and all old flower fields of the soul. But as weary seekers of the best, we come back laden from our quest to find that all the sages said is in the book our mothers read. That's our arsenal. 
one weapon, the Word of God. The writer of Hebrews says that the Word of God is quick, alive, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and bones and marrow, and that it is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. One last point before I close. Let's think about Paul's appeal. He made an appeal in the 17th chapter, and in verses 32 and through 34, you find that there were three different responses to his message. After he preached on the Lord Jesus Christ and had talked about the resurrection, the Bible says in verse 32 that there were some who mocked. You know, I cannot understand for the life of me how anyone can hear about God's amazing grace in Jesus Christ, God's offer of forgiveness, God's offer of peace, God's offer of salvation, God's offer of an eternal home with Him in heaven, and mock God. I don't get it. But you know, people are still mocking God. I was absolutely stunned, Brother Wayne, last year during the 4th of July weekend when there were people clamoring to change the national anthem. And do you know, in one survey, the leading song selected by the people to replace the national anthem was John Lennon's Imagine. Now, first of all, let me tell you that John Lennon was one of the Beatles, but he was a professed atheist. He said that Christianity would vanish from the face of the earth and that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus Christ. He also stated that uh, Jesus was okay for his days, but his followers were simple-minded people who didn't know better. But he wrote the song, Imagine. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell beneath. Above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there are no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to live or die for. And no religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. Oh, you may think I'm a dreamer. But I'm not the only one. Someday I hope you'll join us. And then the world will be as one. Now, if you like that song, you'll have to admit that there's no God. There's no heaven. There's no hell. In fact, there's no sovereignty of nations. Even though in verse 26, Paul says that God has appointed the nations of the world and their times and their boundaries. That tells me that God is in favor of the sovereignty of nations. You also have to believe that there's no religion and nothing worth dying for. Compare that with the Star Spangled Banner written by Francis Scott Key, who was a devout Christian and a Sunday school teacher. teacher. I like one of the verses that says, Blessed with victory and peace, may this heaven rescued land Praise the power that has made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our call it is just. And this be our motto. In God is our trust. You want to change that for some rhyme of a professed atheist? I think not. So there were those who mocked. And then there were those who were procrastinators. They said, we will hear thee again of this matter. I remember about the story of Felix, who was the Roman procurator of Judea. In verse 25 of Acts 24, Paul is speaking and he says to Felix, he says, the God of righteousness and temperance, and judgment to come. As he reasoned of those things, Felix trembled. He was terrified. And Felix said, go thy way for this time. When I have a more convenient season, I will call for thee. So far as we know, he never had a more convenient season, and therefore, so far as we know, he died and went to a devil's hell. 
I also don't understand how anybody can hear the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and the promises of heaven and say, oh, not today, not interested today. But there was another response. In verse 34, it says, there were those who believed. There were those who claved to him, who followed him, who believed. I wrote this story in the Christian Index some years ago. But while I was the editor, I knew that First Baptist Church in Watkinsville, Georgia, went to the University of Georgia twice every year, in the spring and in the fall, and they had what they call the Great Exchange. And I've talked to you about the Great Exchange, but I don't think I've told you this story. At the University of Georgia, they have a free speech zone right next to the Tate Student Center, and people can reserve this free speech zone and, and share whatever message they want to share from socialism and communism to uh, whatever they want to do. Well, twice a year, First Baptist Church Watkinsville goes and they take their students from the University of Georgia and they have a vocal team and they have witnesses and they have tents and they pass out Bibles and gospel tracts and C.S. Lewis' book, uh, Mere Christianity, and Josh McDowell's book, More Than a Carpenter. Well, I was there in the fall of the year when the First Baptist Church of Watkinsville was in charge of the free speech zone. They had students there taking religious surveys, hoping they would lead into a gospel conversation. And I saw several young people or college students come to faith in Christ. It was wonderful. But right in the middle of all that, there was a professor of psychology at the University of Georgia who came and stood. Let's say this is the vocal team. He came and stood right next to the vocal team and held up a sign that said, Ask an Atheist. I found out that he was the faculty sponsor for the University of Georgia Atheist Association. And their motto was being good dogs without God. But there he was standing there holding that sign, ask an atheist. And several people came up to him and I saw him talking to them. I guessed inviting them to come to his atheist club and telling them when it met. But near the end of the day, I saw some of the men from First Baptist Watkinsville, including the pastor, Carlos Sibley, talking to this professor, Rich Saplita. And they put their arms around his shoulders and took him over to a seat and sat down and talked to him. And I walked over close enough to hear them witnessing to him and challenging him to read the Gospel of John and Paul's epistle to the Romans and to come to their church on Sunday. I didn't hear any more about it, but I went back in the spring. And the kids from the church in Watkinsville were doing their thing. It was beautiful. And Rich Sapleta was there. He was not holding up a sign saying, Ask an atheist. He was passing out gospel tracts. He was telling people about the grace of God. I interviewed him, did a story on him. He told me this. He said, all the time I was an atheist, I thought I was big man on campus. I thought I was smart. I thought I knew more than everybody. But he said, there was one thing I couldn't quite figure out. How some of the people that I knew who had become Christians, how their life was so transformed, I couldn't explain it. And so I decided to read the Gospel of John. I decided to read the epistle to the Romans, and as I read those passages of Scripture, my doubts and fears began to melt away, and I knew that I had to become a Christian. Do you know what he's doing now? He's resigned as a professor at the University of Georgia. He went to Luther Rice Seminary. He got a master's degree in Christian apologetics. He has his own ministry at the University of Georgia and leading students to faith in Christ. Amen. On his website, he says this, Come one, come all. Bring your toughest questions. Christianity is capable of 
answering any question you might have and resolving your deepest problems because there is no world view that is superior to the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, his testimony proves the grace of God and the sufficiency of his infallible word. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, it's good to know that an atheist can be saved. And Father, I pray that if there's anyone here who's not absolutely sure of their salvation, that they might open up their hearts to the grace of God and find His salvation, which is so free and so precious. And Father, I pray that we might embrace the Word of God more dearly, realizing that it's the only weapon we need to defeat Satan and to defeat the philosophies and the ideologies of this world. Lord, help us to be strong and true to the Word of God and to our Savior. Lord, do in me whatever you need to do to get glory for yourself tonight. And I pray the same for this people. Lord, I pray if their hearts have been moved and if they've been challenged and if they see something in their lives that they need to turn from and something they need to ask forgiveness for, that they wouldn't hesitate to come to this altar. And I pray that if there's anyone who needs to trust in Jesus, I pray that they'd come and speak to this dear pastor. And Lord, I pray that you'd have your way in every life and every heart. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let's stand together. As you stand, let me just ask you to open up your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know what he's saying to you, and I don't know how he may have used this message to touch your life. But hopefully there was something in the message that pricked your conscience or touched your heart, and you just feel a need to say yes to the everlasting God and to the Savior who loved you and gave himself for you. Just obey God. You know, Evan Roberts in the Welsh Revival went to some churches to preach, and he found out all he had to say was obey God. And people responded. So would you just do that tonight? Whatever he's impressing upon your heart to do, just obey God. Let's sing, Brother David. Speak to my heart, Lord Jesus. Speak that my soul. 